Hello, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This is Robert with God, Family, and Country, and I'm presenting to you another paper that I've written, and doing so from an undisclosed mountain location within the Everlasting Hills. Uh, before I get uh, going into this paper, I just want to do a few housekeeping items. You in the link, there's a link in the description below where you can click on that link, and it'll take you to the God, Family, and Country blog where you can. Download for yourself an absolutely free copy of this to do as it with you as you wish, to study at your own pace, share with others, whatever you wish to do. Um, and while you're at it, feel free to check out some of the other things on on the blog. I'm always trying to, when I have time, update things and add new things. So I hope that you get as um, things out of it, uh, just like I have um, gotten things out of it as I put in things. Uh, uh, posted things on the blog and as I write these papers. And along that same line of thought, I just want to quickly say um, I realize that there are so many resources and places that you could uh, do or visit or even listen to, and it really is a humbling thing that uh, you would take the time to listen to what, um, to what it is I have to share. And I hope that uh, even if you just get one, take one paragraph and you it touches you or you learn something from it, that makes it uh, worthwhile. Because some of these papers I've written quite some time ago, but regardless, as I pull them out and I'm brushing them off and making small edits as I prepare to share, um, I just it's my hope and prayer that uh, your faith and testimony be strengthened and not only the gospel of Jesus Christ and the doctrines, but in the Savior himself. And uh, that's through these things that you can um, come to that greater light and knowledge. Um, so without further ado, let's... Uh, dive right into it. <clears throat> so the title of this paper is one that I believe I received it from President Benson, or Elder Benson, regardless, President Benson at the time, in one of his talks where he said, uh, basically, I like this definition, it's not the official definition, but I, I think it's very fitting, as prophecy, history, and a verse, or in other words, a divine disclosure of future events. So the whole point of this paper is um, and that's one I wrote a few years ago, and then I even made some more updated uh, additions because I thought they were very fitting, is the point of this that I want to do is uh, I'll go over a few of the prophecies of old, but I'm going to break down one prophecy in particular just to show uh, how literal the Lord is in fulfilling his prophecies. Sometimes we hear a lot nowadays that... Uh, um, that Oh, those are just uh, spiritual things, not to be interpreted literally. Uh, physically, these won't happen. It's a spiritual interpretation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the Lord, in pretty much all the cases, especially in the scriptures, He is very literal. So, so, so there we go. There's my little preface. So, uh, the following paper is not intended to be a comprehensive nor exhaustive list of scriptures and prophecies relating to the last days or the days in which we live. As we study the prophecies of the past with the benefit of living now. In being able to look back, we can see that the Lord was not speaking spiritually or figuratively as so many profess in our postmodern world of, quote, I feel, therefore, rather, the Lord was very literal. And you need look no further than the scriptures to clearly see this. However, there will be those that remain in the thought process um, of show and show of doctrinal illiteracy, and soon they will see that they, quote, do err and shall learn the doctrine or prophecies in this case, and that's found in Isaiah 29, 24, great uh, scripture passage. It is the same for future prophecies, given anciently, not so anciently, and as even as recent as the last general conference or within the current issue of the Enzyme magazine. For those seasoned members who may consider themselves a gospel scholar, whatever that may be, as well as new converts or those members that are just waking up from a spiritual slumber and find themselves famished, I hope the words to follow will help ignite in you a desire to know through the Holy Spirit which is given to each man to know of himself or herself that Jesus is the Christ. He loves us and thus gives us warning and admonition to prepare, and therefore we shall not fear. Additionally, my intention isn't to be authoritative or perform a, quote, steadying of the ark action, nor replace that which has been spoken of or written as scripture. Scriptures can be interpreted in many ways by many people. However, I have tried to stay true to the source material and where necessary offer to the the best of my ability an honest interpretation of scripture passages and source material. Therefore, I have tried not to be too specific as I would rather not dabble in speculation or speak for others. 
Rather, my hope is through reading and studying to point others to the living Christ, the Savior and Redeemer of the world, who is at the head of this church and soon will come in great power and glory to rule and reign over his kingdom here on earth. Perhaps I can offer the advice given by Paul, uh, see Second Corinthians, to aid you as in your life, perform work in your gospel study, whatever the topic may be, that is to pray for the Spirit, live by the Spirit, and study by the Spirit. And in turn you shall come to know the great goodness and mercy of God, his plan and mysteries that he is eager to unfold to those that will but ask and then listen. So, <clears throat> prophets of old, prophets in the meridian of time, and prophets of our day. We have all heard the scripture passage, quote, Surely the Lord God will do nothing, save he shall revealeth his secrets unto his servants and the prophet, unto his servants the prophets. Amos three seven. This is true in the days of Adam. Noah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, etc., etc. Even the Lord himself prophesied of things to come, as well as his chosen apostles after he ascended back into heaven. The same applies to today, starting with Joseph Smith and continuing on down to President Nelson. It is for this purpose that we can prepare ourselves and be ready for the times of tribulation, woe, and desolation if we give heed to the words of the Lord's anointed servants and, continue, and listen to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. And just as part of one of the connections for understanding, what is prophecy? Well, in the, the Bible dictionary, the word prophet, uh, the work of a Hebrew prophet was to act as God's messenger and make known God's will. In certain cases, prophets predicted future events, as in the case with the coming of the Messiah. But as a rule, a prophet was a foreteller rather than a foreteller. And to understand the difference between foretell and foretell, the difference being to publish news abroad versus to predict or tell the future before it occurs, um, respectively. So, uh, the prophets were both, but they were definitely a foreteller as well, because especially in the Old Testament times, a lot of they were looking forward to the birth of Messiah. So that's kind of where the whole word prophet came about to be. So, when the prophet Nephi's um, Father Lehi, also a prophet, saw and vision the tree of life, uh, which we can find in 1 Nephi chapter 11. Uh, Nephi, too, desired to have the same vision, and through asking in his faithfulness it was made so. The Holy Spirit proceeds not only to show Nephi the same dream, he also provides an interpretation of the dream, which we can find in 1 Nephi 11, verses 11 through 36. This vision is one of the most glorious and doctrinally filled lessons contained in the Book of Mormon. However, for the purposes here, I wish to focus on verse 25. It talks about the rod of iron being the word of God. Most, by strict definition, have taken this to be the scriptures. If that were true, I then ask this question, why, with more scripture available to the world in our day, but especially the members of the church, including all the conference reports dating back to almost 100 years on the church website, literally in the palm of our hands via cell phones and other devices, why then are so many members falling away? wandering down strange paths, or even pointing the finger of scorn towards those who still faithfully, to those still faithfully clinging to the iron rod? And uh, that's a great question, um, and it's something that I think we're seeing more and more. When I wrote this paper, um, we were seeing it, but even more so, 2020, 2021. And I love this because the Savior gives us a twofold answer to this question. Uh, in order to be saved in the kingdom of God, one must be a baptized of water and of the Spirit, John 3, 5. Pretty well known uh, passage. It is through this holy ordinance and having the gift of companionship of the Holy Spirit that we are sanctified and receive personal revelation. Um, see D&C 84, 23, and 33, and D&C 88, uh, 68. And this is important um, because remember, Nephi doesn't specify what the, quote, word of God is. Therefore, how then is personal revelation not also the word of God? Answer, it is the word of God. And not to be misinterpreted and misunderstood. Uh, the, the scriptures, is, is a, again, it's been determined and it's been interpreted is, is also this word of God, the iron rod. But, uh, uh, again, going back to prophecy, when someone speaks by the power of the Holy Ghost, it is not only prophecy, but it's also scripture. So when we receive our own personal revelation, that is the that is God speaking to us. That is our personal revelation. So, holding on to that iron rod not only is the Word of God in in written form, but also that personal revelation through the Holy Ghost. So, a great insight into that. 
So, uh, continuing on, let us not forget this critical aspect of the vision of the Tree of Life. It will help us to overcome adversity, the mist of darkness, the strange and forbidden paths that might tempt us away, the river and the fountain of filth, and lastly, but certainly not least, the large and spacious building filled with not a few, but multitudes of people, as it says, laughing, mocking, and pointing in the finger of scorn. Appertaining to the last days, President Nelson said the following, quote, In coming days, it will not be possible to survive spiritually without the guiding, directing, comforting, and constant influence of the Holy Ghost. Um, and so that goes right along with the Word of God. That it's, it's also not only Scripture, but also the whisperings of the Holy Ghost. Um, so, having the gift and influence of the Holy Ghost will be as vital as you read, study, and ponder the doctrines of the Gospel. Equally important will be as you live your life, your daily life, having the ability to discern information presented to you in whatever form it may be. There are so many voices in the world, in the world, in the world and platforms in which they are presented. As you stay close to the Lord in the winding up scenes, you can be assured that He will not come as a thief in the night. And speaking of this uh, phrase about a thief in the night, this oft-heard phrase and quoted scripture has been heard by us all and even shared by ourselves. The Apostle Paul to the Thessalonians expounds on this concept and gives us the key to understanding this phrase about the Lord being coming as a thief in the night. So uh, it says, quote, But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night, for when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction come upon them, as travail upon a woman with a child, and they shall not escape. But be ye, brethren, are not in darkness, but ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day, we are not of the night nor of darkness. Uh, that's from First Thessalonians 5, uh, 1 through 6, verses 9, 14, 20 through 22. Uh, it's some great uh, interpretation of that particular uh, oft-quoted scripture concerning the last days, events, the coming of the Lord. Um, and so we need not fear, nor be caught unawares when the Lord does come again. The following scriptures give us further light and knowledge. <laughs> again, verily I say unto you, the coming of the Lord draweth nigh, and it overtaketh the world as a thief in the night. Therefore, gird up your loins, that ye may be children of light, and that day shall not overtake you as a thief. Um, so those living, so the world and those living in Babylon, which even includes members of the church, um, who have one foot in the door of the church and one foot in Babylon, will be overtaken as a thief in the night. However, if we are children of light, we will not be overtaken as by a thief. I love King Benjamin. He teaches this so exquisitely in the Book of Mormon about what it means to be the, quote, children of light. Uh, find that in Mosiah 5, 7. He outlines in his sermon at the temple the keys and principles to become such and see chapters, Moses chapters 2 through 6, um, just exactly, you know, perfect, uh, not only instruction, but doctrine for Latter-day Saints uh, today. So, um, let's go back to the beginning, or Genesis of it all, to help it understand prophecy, and to, to gain some greater understanding about uh, not only the times we live in, but what it is to look for. And quote, and God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons, and for days and years. Genesis one fourteen. In the King James Version of the Bible, the translation should read warning signs for the original Hebrew, and for seasons it is not what we think of spring, summer, autumn, and winter. Rather the Hebrew word is moed, meaning festivals or feast days. Um, this insert and clarification from the book of Genesis will aid in the understanding the topics to follow. So the Lord knew that the stars and the signs in heavens could not be altered by men or the devil. In the book of Abraham, the Lord tells us is how he keeps, how he himself keeps eternal time. And he taught a lot of this to Abraham. And subsequently Abraham then uh, taught a lot of it to the, the Egyptians. There have been many signs in the heavens throughout all the ages of the earth. Several of these instances have been recorded in all the standard works. We should expect the Lord to continue this pattern even in our day. So one of those is found uh, uh, where we can find these is in the book of Revelation, or uh, is also known as the Apocalypse of John. 
to provide some context to the book of Revelation, but more specifically the revelations of the seven seals, in 8096, John was banished to the Isle of Patmos. John is grieved that no man can unlock the seals of these books. However, he learns uh, that Jesus Christ himself can do so. John is thus given the vision of events when, this, when the seal was opened. Um, <clears throat> and uh, what's rather interesting is also, too, uh, as far as a connection for understanding, is contrary to pop culture references, the word apocalypse doesn't mean total destruction or an end-of-world scenario. Rather, the original meaning in Greek for apocalypse is to uncover or reveal. The real meaning has most likely evolved due to the destruction and end of days prophecies contained within the book of Revelations. <laughs> so, again, reiterating a point earlier, it is often discussed that no man knows the hour or the day of his coming. This is true, however, this is not entirely true. The scriptures and addresses from the prophets and apostles, both ancient and modern, speak of the signs, wonders, and the season of his coming. So it doesn't mean that we can't prepare ourselves, just like when we can see the onset of autumn, and even winter time when it starts snowing and all the leaves have basically come off the, the trees. Um, the Lord spoke this to apply to his time and that of the apostles. Um, he didn't mention that future prophets and revelation cannot help us to identify just when the Lord should come. Remember Amos 3, 7. And that was even a teaching of Joseph Smith uh, where, he, where he taught this concept right here as well. Um, Therefore, we will look at these warning signs and wonders using both ancient and recent events that correspond with the scriptures from all the standard works, as well as church material to illustrate that these signs and wonders are not a singular notion or mere coincidence. Rather, God allows history and future events to unfold by design, not by chance, that thereby we might look for his coming in the great in great glory with righteous anticipation. So there's so much to study in the book of Revelation, but I just wanted to hit on uh, this particular uh, thing that uh, the Lord does offer some answers to the Revelation of John and the Doctrine and Covenants, section 77, where this is uh, Joseph Smith asking questions about the book of Revelation, and the Lord gives his answers. So uh, just one of the verses in, is found in verse 12, uh, where it says um, the Lord gives the answer to Joseph Smith about the, the seals and, and the periods. And it says, quote, We are to understand that as God made the world in six days, and on the seventh day he finished his work and sanctified it, and also for a man out of the dust of the earth, even so, in the beginning of the seven thousand years, we will the Lord, sanct Lord God sanctify the earth and complete the salvation of man, and judge all things and shall redeem all things, except that which he hath not put into his power, when he, he shall have sealed all things unto the end of all things, and the sounding of the trumpets of the seven angels are preparing and finishing of his work in the beginning of the seven thousand years, preparing the preparing of the way before the time of his coming. Um, and so one of the great things to understand from this is that in the book of Revelation, the, dis the events described in the first five seals, were, um, when, they were, when the first five seals were open, are only discussed in 11 verses. Uh, the events described when the sixth seal is open is covered in 14 verses, whereas the events described in the seventh is 226. Uh, so obviously a lot more detail was um, was given to the, the sixth and seventh seals. Um, and something, too, that uh, I would definitely recommend most uh, people to look into is uh, the teaching of the prophet Joseph Smith, where he actually covers some of the book of Revelation and give some, some keys to understanding. So, as far as the two witnesses in Jerusalem, spoken of in Revelation 11, 3 through 12, um, uh, some of the things to help us understand is, they shall be raised up to the Jewish nation in the last days of the time of the Restoration to prophesy to the Jews. Um, this is found in DNC 77, 15. You can also find this in Isaiah 51 and Zechariah chapter 4. Um, Another attribute of these witnesses is they will possess a sealing power, uh, like the prophets of old, being able to control the skies and smite the earth with plagues, pestilence, etc. And for examples of this uh, sealing power, we look no further than 1 Kings 17, Helaman 10, Moses 7, and even see the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis 14, verses 30 and 31. Uh, something else that we know about these two witnesses, they will prophesy for 1260 days, or uh, approximately three, three and a half years, 
they'll be then slain. Uh, their bodies will then lie in the street for three and a half days, and then afterwards they'll be uh, resurrected and go forth to um, help defeat these armies that have invaded uh, the capital city, Jerusalem. Some interesting commentary is uh, Elder Bruce R. McConkie stated that, quote, no doubt they will be members of the Council of the Twelve or the First Presidency of the Church. And that's in, found in his doctrinal New Testament commentary. Um, something interesting, too, that I thought was interesting about uh, the, the number three and a half um, in the scriptures, particularly in Revelation, the number three and a half often describes a limited period of tribulation during which evil forces are allowed to do their work. Uh, see Daniel 7 and also Luke 4, Revelation 11, uh, chapter 12 and 13. Since three and a half is half of seven, which symbolizes perfection and completion, uh, it may represent imperfection and apostasy. It may also suggest that God will not allow evil to go on unchecked. Evil's time is bound and its limits are set. And when you think about that in context of seven years of tribulation and famine, uh, Joseph of Egypt, and even as that uh, pertains to our day, as far as uh, the, the seven years of uh, tribulation that we're, we're to see as well. And something, too, is that um, members of the church often get confused on, and perhaps I'll either do a small presentation or point you in the right direction. Either way, I'll, I'll do something. Is uh, Before moving on to these other prophecies, it's important to consider what the head of this dispensation, the prophet Joseph Smith, said in regards to the understanding of the book of Revelation which I really do feel is key and has greatly aided my study and understanding of that book since reading it, and something which has which flies in the face of what we have heard Bible scholars both inside and outside the church, and is thus, and this is from the Prophet Joseph Smith, quote, the things which John saw uh, had no allusion to the scenes of the days of Adam, Enoch, Abraham, or Jesus, only so far as is plainly represented by John and clearly set forth by him. Uh, teaching of the Prophet Joseph Smith, page 289. So all my life on this earth I have been studying the book of Revelation, especially about the seven seals as pertaining to the chronological existence since Adam moving forward. However, if you still aren't convinced or see what the Prophet is trying to say, we'll hear this. Quote, John saw the only which was lying in futurity, futurity and which was shortly to come to pass. So, uh, you know, that's one of those things of it's if you're going to try and put all these seven seals and what's going on as far as like starting from like 4000 BC and then working your way all up to the present day, uh, it just isn't going to work. It's it's going to leave you confused and you're going to uh, just not have that firm understanding and that knowledge to understand the book of Revelation. And uh, if you believe the prophet Joseph Smith to be a prophet of God, well, I think he makes it pretty clear um, just how to understand the book of Revelation. So, um, as far as the uh, Joseph Smith Matthew, uh, that's another great uh, prophecy given by the Lord Jesus Christ, his timeline uh, leading up to uh, the end of days. However, for the sake of time, I would ask you to see my paper video for commentary and breakdown of these prophecies made by Christ himself. Uh, there's also the parable of the ten virgins uh, found in Matthew 25. Additionally, see also my paper video. For a commentary and breakdown of this parable. However, in regards to the parable of the ten virgins, I did think this was interesting. Um, uh, an ancient Jewish marriage custom was for the wedding party to wait until the bridegroom was ready. Once everything was ready, the announcement or call was made 30 minutes before the arrival of the bridegroom. Speaking about John's revelation and the parable of the bridegroom, uh, Bruce Armour Conkey states the following, quote, could this be interpreted to mean this that such a period of a half hour of the Lord's time, or 20.8 years will elapse after the commencement of the 7,000 year period and before the outpouring of the woes, the last three and a half years of tribulation uh, about to be named. Um, and that's found in the Millennial Messiah, page 382. Um, and in conjunction with this, there's also the um, last day um, macro event timeline uh, video paper that I have where you, can, where you can see where that period of tribulation ends, but also the the opening of uh, um, this, the commencement of the 7,000 year period, the, the seventh seal, and how that, as Bruce R. McConkie states, this possible half hour or just almost 21 years fits in in some of the events that will be to follow. Um, <clears throat>
also something to in to read as far as uh, the parable of the ten virgins is uh, President Nelson said an announcement on January first of twenty twenty, uh, titled "My twenty twenty My twenty twenty invitation to you share the message of the restoration of the Savior's gospel." Um, and even October twenty nineteen, he specifically noted to study DNC eighty four and eighty eight, and he made further mention that the time to act is now. And uh, that this upcoming 2020 April conference will be a, quote, hinge point in the history of the church. And your part or our part is very vital to this. So, again, the, the prophet is trying to get us to wake up to see these prophecies, to understand them better, so we know how we fit into um, the events to play out very shortly. So, the prophecy of Daniel. <laughs> Let us turn to an Old Testament prophet that we're all familiar with, Daniel. At least we should be. We should be very familiar with the account of him being placed in the lion's den. Additionally, we have the account of Daniel's companions, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Abednego being placed in the fiery furnace and saved by an angel of the Lord. Perhaps lesser known is Daniel's prophecy about the Savior and his messianic announcement upon Jerusalem. And this is the part that I mentioned I really want to break down his prophecy just to show how literal the Lord is and that he is far from figurative like so many make prophecies and parables out to be, especially parables. So let's get started. The Jews were told the exact day their Messiah would come nearly 600 years in advance. In 605 BC, the Babylonians besieged Jerusalem. After the siege, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, brought back from Jerusalem a handful of Israelites who were, quote, skillful in all wisdom and cunning and knowledge and understanding of science. And this, that the Babylonians might teach them the learning and the tongue of the Babylonians. It's found in Daniel 1. Among these Israelites taken captive to Babylon were Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. About eight years later, in 587 BC, the Babylonians again laid siege on Jerusalem. This time, however, they burned the temple, destroyed the city, and carried the remainder of the Israelites captive into Babylon. There the Jews remained in bondage for 70 years. This captivity was prophesied by the prophet Jeremiah, who said, quote, And this whole land of Jerusalem shall be a desolation, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. The Lord would later reveal to the Jews why 70 years of captivity was required from them. Previously, the Lord gave the Israelites a commandment that they failed to obey, the Israelites were previously commanded to, quote, sow the field for six years, and on the seventh year, let the land rest. This is part of the law of Moses. And the seventh year was to be, quote, a Sabbath of years. Therefore, just as man was to rest from his labors every seventh day, and his work commanded even to this day, the Israelites were also commanded to let the land rest every seventh year. On the seventh year, for the entire year, Israelites were not to dig, sow, or prune. Rather, they were to reap and live off the only what they, the earth produced spontaneously. This command was to be observed the entire time that the Israelites occupied the promised land of Palestine. However, for 490 years, the entire length of time the children of Israel occupied this land, they failed to obey this commandment. Therefore, the Lord said that they had to repay the land 70 years worth of Sabbaths. The Israelites therefore remained in captivity for 70 years, from 605 B.C. to 537 B.C. It's found in Daniel 9.24, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. Uh, so near the end of this captivity, Daniel, who was in Babylon at the time, was studying the writings of Jeremiah. He discovered that Jeremiah prophesied that their captivity in Babylon would only last 70 years. This would mean, as Daniel realized, that the Israelite captivity would come to an end in the very near future. In Daniel's own account, he states, I, Daniel, understood by the books, by books, the number of the years, wherefore of the Lord... Wherefore, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So, having read Jeremiah's prophecy and knowing that the 70 years is almost up, Daniel, quote, prayed unto the Lord. In the middle of his prayer, a heavenly messenger who revealed himself as Gabriel interrupted him. As it turned out, Gabriel came to Daniel with a very specific and impressive prediction. Gabriel revealed to Daniel the exact day that Jesus would present himself as the, Messiah, as the Messiah to the Jews at Jerusalem. Gabriel revealed the following, quote, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to the, re 
to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Daniel 9.25 Upon reading this verse, it may seem hard to understand. So let's therefore break down this verse and what Gabriel is revealing to Daniel. We will come to understand one of the most impressive predictions in the entire Old Testament. Gabriel said that from a future commandment given by later, given later by given later by the king of Persia to rebuild the city of Jerusalem, and then unto the time of the Messiah shall be sixty nine weeks. So, uh, when used in the context of the book of Daniel, this term week has reference to a week of years or seven years. So when Gabriel says that the Messiah will come in sixty nine weeks, what he is really saying is that the Messiah will come in 69 periods of 7 years each. If multiplied out, 69 times 7 is 483 years. This is how long Gabriel says it will be from the future commandment given by the king of Persia to rebuild the city of Jerusalem unto the time of the Messiah. If we can pinpoint the date as to when this later command to rebuild Jerusalem was given, we would have our starting point. As it turns out, this command to rebuild Jerusalem is in fact documented in the Old Testament. As previously mentioned, in 537 B.C., the Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem and burned the temple. As a result, Jerusalem remained in ruins for many years. After their captivity, the Jews returned to Jerusalem, and Artaxerxes, the king of Persia, granted them permission to rebuild the city and its surrounding wall. Uh, see Nehemiah uh, chapter 2, 5 through 8, and 17, 18. Note that the temple was already completed at the time of this command. Uh, see Ezra 6, 14. The command given by Artaxerxes Artaxerxes, king of Persia, was to rebuild the wall surrounding Jerusalem. Uh, again, referred to Nehemiah 2.17. We know this is the command referred to in Daniel 9.25 because Gabriel specifically states that, quote, the wall surrounding Jerusalem will be rebuilt. Um, Daniel 9.25. So, the Jews rebuild their city and temple under Artaxerxes. I hope I'm saying that right. <laughs> according, to the multiple, according to multiple historians and many other historical records, we know that this event occurred in 445 B.C. I see Sir Robert Anderson, the coming prince. Thanks to the Old Testament, we know the exact day that this command was issued. Nehemiah 2.1 states that the king Artaxerxes issued this command on Nisan 1st, the first month of the Jewish calendar. Uh, Nisan 1st, translated in our calendar, is the equivalent to the date March 14th. With this information, we can conclude that the date of this command was March 14th, 445 B.C., this was the day Gabriel had reference to when he said, quote, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem. We also know the ending date that Gabriel spoke of when he said, quote, unto the Messiah the Prince, in 9.25 this phrase, Messiah the Prince, has reference to both a religious leader, Messiah, and a po political leader, Prince. The word Hebrew for Prince, Nagid, implies king. Therefore, in effect, Gabriel is telling Daniel that the true Jewish Messiah would present himself as a political leader or king on a certain day, 483 years from the command given by Artaxerxes to build Jerusalem. The question is thus, was there ever a time when Jesus permitted himself to be adorned as a king? We know that there were many times that his followers wanted to make him king, but each time they attempted to do so, Jesus slipped away from them, frustrating their plans. For one example, see John 6.15. As the New Testament scholar Chuck Meisler points out, quote, Then one day Jesus does something out of the ordinary. He not only permits it, he arranges it. He deliberately sets things up to fulfill Zechariah's prophecy. It states the following, Rejoice greatly, Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just, and having salvation, lowly, and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt the foal of an ass. Zechariah 9.9 it was during his triumphal entry to Jerusalem that Jesus presented himself as a king to the Jews, or as Gabriel put it, quote, Messiah the Prince. According to Luke, quote, And when Jesus was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice in saying, Praise God, saying, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Everything about this event indicates that Jesus was here presenting himself as a king to the Jews, the animal he rode on was meant for a king. People in the streets laid down palm branches and, quote, spread their garments before Jesus, something that was only done for kings. According to Elder Bruce R. McConkie, quote, only kings and conquerors receive such an extraordinary token of respect. In every part of this triumphal entry to Jerusalem, Jesus seems not only to permit, 
but to court the adulation and homage normally reserved for kings and great rulers. Doctrinal New Testament Commentary by Bruce R. McConkie. This is why the Pharisees were so outraged to see Jesus during his triumphal entry. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto Jesus, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And Jesus answered and said unto them, I tell you that if my followers should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Because Jesus was essentially presenting himself as the king of the Jews, the Pharisees were naturally outraged. No doubt this triumphal entry was the day that Gabriel had reference to in Daniel 9. And, as it turns out, the date for this triumphal entry is also documented. Jesus was crucified on Passover in 32 AD. We know this because Jesus started his ministry the same year of Caesar Tiberius, the 15th reign. See Luke 3, 1. Tiberius replaced Caesar Augustus, who, des who died August 9th, 14 AD, and was appointed in that same year. If he was in his 15th year, this would mean Jesus began his ministry in 20 AD, Jesus was crucified on the fourth Passover from the beginning of his ministry, making it 32 AD, just four days after his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Every year, Passover falls on the 14th day of the month, uh, Nisan, Exodus 12.6. It was four days before the Passover, before Passover, when Jesus presented himself as a king during this triumphal entry, making this day fall on the 10th of Nisan, 32 AD. Nisan... The 10th, 32 AD, correlates to April 6, 32 AD on our calendar. Now we have both dates that Gabriel had referenced to when he said, quote, From the beginning, from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be 69 weeks or 483 years. So, <clears throat> a little connection for understanding, too, if you want to take time to look at that. So, from Artaxerxes' command, March 14th, 45 B.C., unto the triumphal entry, and I, I'm highlighting these words because it plays into what uh, Gabriel announced to Daniel, so just a little understanding there. So, unto the triumphal entry, April 6th, 32 A.D., shall be 483 years. If you were to multiply 483 years with the Jewish calendar of 360 days per year, you could say that Gabriel is telling Daniel that the Messiah would come in one. 173,880 days from the command that Artaxerxes to rebuild Jerusalem. It is interesting to observe what Jesus expected of his people in return for allowing Gabriel to reveal the exact day their Messiah would come. Returning to the account in Luke 19, after Jesus is held as a king during his triumphal entry, he nears the city of Jerusalem and begins to weep. Uh, see verse 41. Jesus then says something extremely profound. Jesus begins by criticizing the Jews, his own people, for not recognizing him as their Messiah. Even when Gabriel revealed the exact day that he would come, he said, Jesus, If thou hast known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thy eyes, for the days shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round about, and keep thee in, in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. So this is not only referencing both his visitation as Messiah, but also the visitation of the Roman legions. Um, under Titus in AD 70 to destroy. So, Jesus demonstrated that he held the Jews, and especially the leaders that espoused to know and expound to the populace the Holy Scriptures, and because they did not, he told them that Jerusalem would be destroyed as a result. This is fulfilled to the very letter uh, in AD 70, when the Romans under Titus laid siege on Jerusalem over several months and destroyed the city, killing over uh, one million Jews, some even estimate as high as one and a half million Jews. And Jesus also details this in Matthew 24 to his disciples. Uh, so, going back to Daniel, Gabriel also told Daniel that would, what would happen immediately after Jesus presented himself as king to the Jews. Gabriel said that after his triumphal entry, quote, shall the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. Here we have a prophecy that the Messiah will be executed as it is right there in the Jewish Old Testament. It also says that Messiah, the, this Messiah would not be cut off for himself. 
meaning he will be slain for us. Gabriel then revealed that after this Messiah is slain, quote, the prince shall come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. Jerusalem and its sanctuary, the Temple of Solomon, was destroyed completely in AD 70, after Jesus was crucified. These scriptures are very specific. The true Jewish Messiah will be will present will present himself as king to the Jews 483 years from a certain point in time. He will then be slain on behalf of others, but before the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. So as far as we can tell, there's only one person in history who fits each of these requirements, Jesus of Nazareth, the Savior and Redeemer of the world. So, Daniel continues to give prophecies concerning the last days prior to the Lord's second coming. Chapters 10 through 13, often known as the Apocalypse of Daniel, are filled with an abundance of material and reference to go off of. Daniel 12 has very revealing information about what is to take place in the last days concerning the saints of God. Um, an interesting uh, mention in the dedicatory prayer of the Salt Temple gives us perhaps an insight into what Daniel foresaw. And it's awesome. I've, I have a link down here where you can see it exactly and read this entire dedicatory prayer. But I'm only going to quote this one particular past part. And it says, quote, Heavenly Father, when thy people shall not have the opportunity of entering this holy house to offer their supplications unto thee, and they are oppressed and in trouble, surrounded by difficulties, or assailed by temptation, and shall turn their faces towards this thy holy house, and ask thee for deliverance, for help, for thy power to be extended in their behalf, we beseech thee to look down from thy holy habitation, in mercy and tender compassion upon them, and listen to their cries. Um, so this is powerful, and uh, when I found this particular uh, quote, this would have been in 2019, and obviously we've seen since then uh, a closure of all of our temples, either completely or very on a very limited basis. Um, and I believe it was even talked about in April conference. This was even made mention, this part of the dedicatory prayer. So uh, this is, again, just speculation, but one possible interpretation of the verse found in Daniel uh, chapter 12. But I would highly recommend uh, searching these chapters of Daniel 13 and pray for the spirit of discernment. So, after going over in detail just one prophecy given to the prophet Daniel, we could just as well profit from a study of all the following prophecies and events connected to him. Uh, finding Genesis 6, Noah, the great flood. Genesis 15, Abraham and 400 years of Israel being scourged. Genesis 19, uh, Lot and the destruction of Sodom. Genesis 41, Joseph of Egypt and the, the years of plenty and famine. Um, even in Deuteronomy 28, we find where Moses prophesies of the siege of Jerusalem by the Romans. Elijah, uh, a three-year three year drought. Second uh, Chronicles 22, Elijah uh, also outlines uh, the consequence of idol worship. Joshua 6, where Joshua uh, in the city of Jericho in that capture. Daniel 2, where Daniel uh, interprets Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And also... In Daniel chapter 5, he also um, prophesies about Babylon being conquered, which no one thought was even possible, but it was done. Uh, Jeremiah 20, where Jeremiah um, prophesies of the captivity of Judah. And then even in Ezra 1 and 2, Cyrus allows Jews to return back to Jerusalem. And, of course, there's dozens of prophecies about Jesus Christ um, coming in the meridian of time. So, however... History clearly shows, both in secular and holy writ, that these prophecies were carried out to the very letter. So why shall we continue to think that the Lord will not carry out the future Latter-day prophecies still yet to be fulfilled to the very letter? Um, for some of those answers, I would, um, and just to see some of the prophecies talked about that are yet to come, I would recommend checking out my video presentation uh, titled Last Day's Macro Event Timeline Introduction. Uh, there are plenty of sources, including church member, church members creating YouTube videos and creating these blogs that would suggest the very opposite, that all oh, these things are not to be interpreted literally, that it's all spiritual. But uh, right here, I would say, no, uh, there's plenty of evidence right here. And then the, the few pages that I did breaking down just one prophecy in Daniel to, to suggest otherwise, um, as far as this whole debate about 
literal and spiritual, and uh, etc. So, um, here's a little something that I thought was fun, uh, and to as far as like understanding jubilees and going back to the let them be for seasons, days, and years. So I'm not going to go over it, but I would just allow you to either a take a screenshot of that. Uh, let me back that out just a little bit. To understand jubilees and uh, seven, you know, seven periods of a thousand years, and um, from Adam to Abraham, Jesus, and then so on and so forth. So, just a little something. So, in conclusion, please search diligently the scriptures. Thus, it will be given plainly to you the revelations of what I like to call. Uh, the three M's of the scriptures, or even of the gospel. It's the milk, meat, and the mysteries of God that pertain to your salvation and exaltation. The aforementioned topics and scriptures contain so much more insight and revelation than what has been explained here. Don't wait for tomorrow. What can be done today? Prepare for April conference. Prepare for the second comings of the Lord. I write and share all this with you to inspire you to action and good works, faith in the Lord, and to love and serve him with all your might, mind, and strength. Additionally, I hope you can see that the scriptures are filled with examples of men called of God. The Lord continues to inspire church leaders today to lead and guide and make known his will for us as we prepare for His the world for his second coming. Therefore, through revelation given by the Holy Spirit, it will lead and guide those that are of a broken heart and a contrite spirit. The very opposite of the world and Gentile society advocates and preaches today, is it not? The Lord has asked that we be a peculiar people. The Hebrew word is derived from the, the word peculiar is derived from the Hebrew word pecuniary, which means, quote, bought with a price. And indeed we have. Jesus has paid that price, and he has extended the covenants, promises, and blessings to us so we may remain peculiar and be holy without spot. May we all be blessed as we individually and collectively strive to instill the principles of Zion in our hearts and minds. Thus, when we are called upon by the prophet to prepare the way of the Lord, we will indeed heed the call. Without delay is my sincere hope and desire in the name of Jesus Christ.